Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. And firstly, I would like to thank the organizers and Bosso for inviting me here. My first time in Slovenia, and it's I think really amazing. And also, the conference is very, very interesting. I think we have the opportunity to discuss many things that are very relevant in the in the context of, of the cannabis uh, potential use for I mean, the, the potential use of cannabinoids as therapeutic agents. So the story I want to tell today is a bit more on on the uh, anti-tumoral action of cannabinoids, the work that we have been doing for quite a long time in the lab uh, in relation with Manuel Guzman, Cristina Sánchez, but also in my group. Um, and I will tell you from the beginning, so it will be the basic studies that we did initially. The first clinical study will clarify a little bit more about this intracranial administration. Then how we try to follow up, uh, how could we improve this therapy? Uh, the, this last clinical study that was performed by GW and some other future studies that are under design. And then I also will try to go to the practicalities that we have been also listening to now. So how we could try to translate this into the patients. In the meantime, we have results of clinical studies because that's probably also the main point and, and many patients need uh, an answer right now. So I try to go through the different things and, and, and to discuss them. So obviously the first thing is what is very well established. Can you hear me? Yeah. So what is very well established is this uh, palliative act applications of cannabis in cancer. So that's uh, something that now is accepted and it's well known that many uh, different cannabinoids in different clinical studies, some of them have been reviewed right, right now, they have efficacy. I think one main point, and I think it's also been pointed today, is that maybe cannabinoids are not going to, the, to be the magic drug that cures everything. We need to see whether in comparison with other medicines, uh, they could be better, or in some cases for some patients, uh, they could be resistant to the standard therapy and they may, maybe they prefer to use cannabinoids. In some other cases, maybe it's the primary election because actually they are working better than other, other compounds. So probably we need to understand well, what is the situation. In the context of cancer, uh, well, there are comparison with other uh, drugs that have been used for the treatment of the different side effects. So now some vomiting, that is one of the main effects that these patients who have uh, anti-cancer therapies normally undergo. Obviously, a stimulation of appetite, uh, also uh, pain in, in cancer patients. So probably cannabis have a lot of potential here to be used in combination with some of these compounds, sometimes alternatively. But I think this is quite well established and we will see a lot of this, I hope, in the near future. Then, Obviously, we can move to the potential and the cancer activity of cannabis. And as it has been mentioned before, the first evidence of the potential uh, of cannabinoids as anti-cancer agents was in the 70s. So there were already this group in the United States who were actually investigating before uh, cannabinoid receptors were identified or, or the mechanism of action was identified. They already showed that there could be anti-cancer activity. And this actually got in, in, in newspapers, but then this investigation was abandoned, let's say, or nobody followed with that. Then, at the end of the 90s, this picture that was shown also before, uh, in the laboratory, we have started to investigate, just by chance, actually, on a, a specific type of, of brain cancer that has been mentioned before. This glioblastoma subtype is actually a very aggressive type of cancer, so the life expectancy of patients who have this type of brain cancer, normally it's 14 months uh, maximum. And this has, has not changed a lot in the last time. I will show you on the slide later. However, what we found, or was found in the lab, is that treatment of glioma cells with TAC was producing the, the death of these cells. And then translated this into animal models. Uh, what, what was done was to generate a brain tumor by injecting glioma cells directly in the brain of the animals and then uh, doing the treatment with TAC or without treatment, the treatment with Baker, we call it uh, something that where you saw the cannabis. And in one third of the RAS, as was shown this morning, there was this anti-cancer activity, so the tumor was completely eliminated. Some other rats were living longer, although the tumor was still there. So it was not that all animals were being cured, but a significant fraction of them was cured. And this opened a new line of research that we have been following for the last 15 years or, or, or more now. Now we now 
that in animal models of cancer, I want to stress this because many of the experiments were done in animal models, but then one thing is animal models, one different thing is very useful in, in human patients. Uh, but we, we know that there are many different cancer types where uh, uh, cannabinoids, TAC or TAC plus CBD or sometimes other synthetic cannabinoids have some anti-cancer activity. We started with this glioma, but many other laboratories also were investigating in different cancer types, including skin carcinomas or breast cancer, uh, leukemia, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, uh, hepatic cancer, lung cancer. There are many others in which different researchers have shown anti-cancer action of cannabinoids in animal models. Why cannabinoids have this? And to me, this is important. At the end, I'm a scientist. Um, I think one important point is trying to understand why cannabinoids produce these effects. They, they need to have a mechanism of action, and if we understand that, then we can actually pay much more. But also we can convince the medical community, the scientific community, that this is actually working. So a lot of research during all these years have shown that actually cannabinoids, uh, and particularly TNC, have anti-cancer activity due to the fact that they can control three of the main activities that the cancer has got. So on one hand, you have the uncontrolled proliferation of cancer cells. And actually, we know that a TAC can attain this uncontrolled proliferation and can also promote cancer cell death. That's important. But also, tumors to grow, they need to, they need to get nutrients and oxygen. And the way they deliver that to the tumor, get the, this is through a process is called angiogenesis. So it will be the generation or modification of vessels to, to allow the blood to get into the tumor and then produce uh, the, the release of nutrients and oxygen in the tumor. But cannabinoids can be shown to normalize these, but these vessels. They are able to inhibit tumor angiogenesis, and then they, are con they may contribute to reduce this uh, growth due to the generation of new vessels or modification of new vessels in the tumor. And finally, they also have the ability to reduce the migration of cancer cells. And this is important because, as you probably know, most of the patients that die of cancer, they die of them because of the metastasis, because of the tumor cells moving from the renal tissue and going to some other tissue generating a new tumor that normally is very resistant. So apparently, cannabinoids can, uh, can also modify this ca capacity. Why? Because they regulate different signaling mechanisms within the cell. Um, and we have investigated quite a lot how this is working. Um, I'll show you very briefly later, because this is probably very complicated from the biochemical point of view. But it's also important because that means that we understand quite well why a cancer cell is responding in, this, in these ways. So regulating different signaling pathways, different mechanisms that are important for the cancer to regulate these processes. But then another interesting thing about cannabinoids is that they have very low toxicity. Actually, uh, the people who are against the use of cannabis, they can claim that it produces side effects because it has psych uh, psychoactivity, may modify neural circuits. It could do many things, but what it does not do is producing toxicity. It doesn't produce the death of normal cells, let's say. And I, I wanted to bring this experiment that we did and say, you know, more than 10 years ago now. The same thing is uh, something that we can show a result that is very easily, or can be very easily interpreted for everyone. So in this case, what we did is to generate uh, tumors by injecting pancreatic cancer cells within the pancreas of mice. Uh, so we generate tumors, and one can follow very easily the difference between normal cells in the pancreas or tumor cells. You have different density and they are very different. And then we, we treat uh, these, these mice with cannabis, sector, we have a, a very good response of the treatment, but then what we did is also to follow the number of cells that were dying in the tumor. So we used a, a technique that is called tunnel that basically marks those cells that are dying by a programmed cell death. Something that many, many times occurs in the cells uh, on a way that um, the cells can be eliminated by the body. And some drugs, including TAC, can promote apoptosis. However, one can follow this by this red stain. So all cells that are dying of apoptosis are marked by these red dots. I don't know if you can see them properly. In any case, as you can see, basically all red dots that correspond to cells that are dying concentrate in the tumor. That would be this, this area here. So this is the staining that corresponds to this area. However, normal, normal pancreatic cells are not having this 
red, pot, red dots, what means actually that they are not dying of apoptosis. So the same treatment in the same animal only produces cancer cell death in the tumor, but not in the normal cells. So this, this might be interesting because that gives the, the potentiality of being compounds with low toxicity. Obviously, there are many drugs that are being used for the treatment of cancer nowadays that they are toxic, but still they are being used. So they kill almost equally cancer cells and cells in the body that are dividing normally. However, having a tool like cannabinoids that may be more specific on cancer cells could be potentially interesting. I think that's one of the advantages that these compounds may have. But then in terms of how can we apply this to clinical, uh, to patients. So, uh, Let's talk a little bit about this first clinical study that has been just mentioned in the previous talk. So in this case, we're actually a very small study, only nine patients, it has been mentioned, that had this glioblastoma. Uh, they have been diagnosed initially of the, with this type of, of tumor. They underwent the standard therapy, so they were treated with cryotherapy and also chemotherapy. And then when they were uh, having a, a relapse, and unfortunately, most patients with this disease have a new tumor afterwards. Then they were offered the possibility of entering the clinical study. So the tumor was actually being removed. Obviously, for that you need to do, uh, you need to open the skull, remove the tumor, and then in the in, in, in the space left by the tumor, a cannula was was left there, and there was, uh, let's say, an intracranial administration rather than intratumoral was more directly in the space left by the tumor uh, of Taisy. And then uh, these patients were, were, were followed uh, through the response that they may have, particularly that the first thing was analyzing toxicity. So there was no any toxicity associated to this delivery of Taisy. Uh, and also well, the idea was following uh, other variables, like if the mechanism of action was activated in these patients, also in the tumors in humans, or whether there was any change in survival or response to therapy uh, radiologically. So we actually found in samples of two patients that we, we managed to get a sample before and after the treatment with TAC, and we always found that different signs, uh, I won't go into detail, but, but these are different stains that implies that there is lower proliferation in the sample that was coming from the patient that have been, have been treated with TAC, there were a lower number of vessels, so lower angiogenesis, and there were signs of autophagy and, and apoptosis, that are the mechanism of action that we know is activated in cancer cells when they are treated with TAC. So that was very important because it was showing that actually what we have found in animal models or we have found in cells could also be activated in humans. So that means that doing a treatment directly in humans may also activate this mechanism. This seems trivial, but probably for the medical community it's important because then you can actually confirm that what you have found is not just a game that you did in, in cells when you were in the lab. It's something that actually may be also important for, for patients. However, when we went to the survival, as has been mentioned before, the first uh, result was obviously TAC was not going to be the magic drug that was going to cure cancer because at the end, all patients, so this is the typical representation, it's called Kaplan major representation, but basically it gives you the fraction of persons who are still alive at a certain time. So the fact that the line finally reaches this limit means that all patients finally died. So that means that not, the patients were not cured. Uh, it's true that two patients respond, or they live much longer than expected, or longer than expected, and three or four patients have radiological responses <coughs> during the treatment. So actually there was some evidence that TAC was doing something, but it was not like the definitive cure of, of glioblastoma. At least in this study, it was very small. <coughs> One cannot take a statistical conclusion of, of a study that is only with nine patients, but obviously gives you, it was encouraging, but it was meaning that this could be potentially improved. <coughs> and actually, uh, we have tried to do a lot of research trying to improve this. And, and then for that, we try to, to take three different uh, approaches. One, trying to understand very well how uh, TAC is working in cancer cells. Uh, and, but, but also trying to identify factor of resistance. For instance, not all cancer cells may respond the same. And even within the same tumor, not all patients are having exactly the same response to a therapy. Some of the patients develop resistances 
some of the patients are more or less sensitive. So if we understand why some of the patients are more sensitive to TAC, uh, then we may actually uh, be able to uh, improve the treatment because we may be able to actually decide which patients uh, could have the treatment and which patients may not have it because maybe it's not working well. And obviously also designing combinational therapies that uh, I will tell uh, now the, the story. So one of the things was trying to understand the mechanism of function. I am bringing this, uh, it was the front page of Cancer Cell. So Cancer Cell is a scientific journal, very prestigious in the medical community. And it was the consequence of a long, long work that we have done for a long time. And then we have continued uh, with other publications. Why I think this is important? For, uh, for us as scientists, it was obviously a proud because it's very complicated to publish there. there is uh, a review by other scientists that have to decide whether the work is, is, is suitable for that journal or not. But the point is that if we want to have this knowledge to be recognized by the medical and scientific community, then we need to convince them that actually it's working. So by publishing in a journal that is very prestigious, and then, look, the journal decided to do this front page. So it was like a forest of marijuana uh, and a skull showing that marijuana was inducing cell death. Obviously, it was very spectacular, but what meant in one of the most prestigious journals in the cancer research, they were actually uh, acknowledging that the results were supporting this activity. And this, together with previous studies, I think is a, a very good thing for the cannabis research in this field, because it actually supports and makes the, the medical and scientific community accept that this is something that is actually uh, happening. Obviously, we did a lot of research, I, I won't go into detail, but we know quite well why cannabinoids, and particularly TAC, act on cancer cells. And we know that one of the most important things is the activation of the cannabinoid receptors that are in the membrane of many cancer cells. And then they activate a very complex signal in pathway that we have dissected by many experiments uh, that well, leads finally to the apoptotic death of the cells. If someone is interested, obviously we can discuss the mechanism, but I don't want to, to go into something uh, too detailed. But you want, we can discuss it because this is what we do mainly in the lab, actually. Also, another thing that is important is obviously in, in marijuana, TAC is probably the main active component because it's the one that is binding with high affinity to cannabinoid receptors, but there are other cannabinoids. Uh, for some of them, we don't have so much information. For some of them, we have uh, a bit more. For instance, cannabidiol has also anti-cancer activity. We have found that also in animal models of cancer and many other groups. In, in our hands, it's less potent than TAC, but it still has anti-cancer activity. The problem is that we don't know so well how it's working, and that's a handicap for CBD, but it still doesn't rule out the possibility that CBD could be also used, maybe in combination with TAC, as I will show now, in anti-cancer therapies. In any case, uh, well, it's also important to understand well how the CBD is working because that will help uh, to know better and to convince also the medical community that this has to be used also in humans. Then, as I mentioned, it was important identifying the mechanism of resistance. We also have data on that point, but suggest that some cells, some cancer cells may express, may express factors of resistance to, to the action of cannabinoids. But also, that was interesting because it suggests that we can also manipulate these cells to make them more sensitive. And this may lead to other treatments in the future. But it also suggests that, say, patients, some patients may respond better than others. And like for any other treatment, for any other disease, one could decide maybe for this particular patient, if we can identify certain markers, we can be quite sure that cannabinoids are going to work well on, on them. Maybe some others, they have factors for resistance and maybe they could be suitable for other different therapy. So we are not proposing that cannabinoids have to be used for everything, for everyone, for every tumor, but maybe we can actually define which patients uh, could be more suitable for this treatment. And then the, the final approach was also trying to see whether we could combine cannabinoids with other anti-cancer agents, because most of the clinical trials and most of the treatments in cancer nowadays consist of, of the treatment with a cocktail of different compounds different drugs that are being used in combination and have been shown to, to have a better effect than other options. So our point was maybe we can add TAC or other cannabinoids to the current treatments that are being used for, for the treatment of cancer. And in that case, our main experience was in glioblastoma, so we tried to see what was being used for the treatment 
of glioblastoma. There were many options, but one of the main options was combining with temozolomide. I'll go into uh, details now. But temozolomide is the chemotherapeutic agent that is used for the treatment of glioblastoma patients nowadays. And, and then we decided that maybe we could combine cannabinoids with temozolomide. However, and this also reflects the limitations of fatty acid tra treatments nowadays. Again, here we can show in this graphic the survival of the patients that have been treated with radiotherapy or with the combination of temozolomide and radiotherapy that is the standard of care for glioblastoma patients nowadays. Obviously, temozolomide and radiotherapy has a lot of toxicity, uh, but that's, uh, that's real. But by using this treatment, one gets uh, and a certain improvement. So there is a fraction of patients who live a bit longer, not that much. And also, there is a fraction of patients that survive um, for longer times, and normally one does, does not get only with radiotherapy. But this is not really a very eff effective treatment. If one compares, for instance, with the treatment of some types of breast cancer that are responding very well to therapy, or some types of leukemias or lymphomas that people can actually get cured, so maybe one is going through well, a real nightmare that is the chemotherapy treatment, but at least one knows that at the end has a higher chance of get, of get cured. But in this case, actually, uh, chances are very limited and most of the patients don't survive. So that's the reality. Um, but it's the only thing that medical doctors can offer today to the patients. So we thought that there could be some room, at least in theory, to improve this situation. And then we designed experiments to combine TAC with temozolomide. So we thought maybe we can get some good results. And actually, this was the, like the first experiment that we did where we compared, this is a, a graph, scientific graph, where we are showing the, the growth of the tumor, the volume of the tumor at different days after the injection. So we inject cells in new mice, and then we, or we treat with Baker, or we treat with the different treatments, and then we follow the size of the tumor after uh, different days. So up to, in this case, in this experiment, after 15 days. So this curve means that the tumor was growing. It was growing less uh, when we were treating with TAC or temozolomide, but when we were treating with a combination of TAC and temozolomide, then we actually had, in many cases, a complete regression of the tumor and a reduction in the size of the tumor. So after this experiment, we developed a lot of experiments uh, with cells that were resistant to temozolomide or to TAC. Uh, with different vias of administration, trying to really see whether we could actually translate this into humans. And then, uh, one of the things that we also consider is, if we want to translate this, this into humans, what is the best strategy? Because, for instance, the previous trial had been done independently of any pharmaceutical company, but actually it was very complicated to follow, because doing a clinical trial is expensive. You need to get involved many doctors, you need to get involve many personnel in the hospitals. It's something very complex to do. You want to do it well and do it in a manner that can be recognized by the medical community. So we thought maybe one option could be using uh, something that is already in the clinics now, it has been approved, Sativex, for the treatment of uh, multiple sclerosis. So we thought maybe that was an option also because CBD has anti-cancer activity by itself. At that time, it was already some experiments on that. Actually, we did a lot of experiments to combine TAC and CBD, and then we found that we could use slightly slower doses of TAC by using the combination with CBD. And then, obviously, there was something. So, so then we approached GWU, and well, we have to do a lot of things. I could tell a lot about uh, pharmaceutical companies, and not particularly in favor, but also I would like to say that sometimes they are needed. But I tell you that I could tell a long story about the relationship with them, so and not uh, very positive in many cases. However, the truth is that it was possible to do, to do at least at this stage, a new clinical study that actually was similar to the previous one, but with a higher number of patients. So this study that has also been mentioned has just finished. Basically, it was second-line study. So uh, was patients diagnosed with glioblastoma, they underwent this standard therapy, radiotherapy plus temozolomide, and then when they have relapsed, they were divided in two groups. One arm was placebo plus temozolomide, and the other arm was sativex plus temozolomide. And the idea was first seeing what the combination was safe in patients, so it was a, the first part of the trial was six patients to see whether there was toxicity associated to the combination of temozolomide and sativex, that they didn't find. 
And then finally, the second part was trying to analyze the survival of the patient. And, and we have been told uh, before, the results of the study have, have not been actually published yet, uh, but basically, well, suggest that actually there is a positive response, not a complete cure of the patients, just a positive response and increased survival after one year of treatment. So I think that's encouraging because this is a very resistant tumor type. Also, the tumors are already very resistant because they were resistant to the initial therapy uh, from the beginning. Then, this is also a nice story because we have many, many problems with the GW in the sense that we wanted to have the clinical study also performed in Spain because actually the design of the study was done by a medical oncologist called Juan Sepúlveda who did all the design of the study. Also, we participated a lot in the design of the translational study that has been done. But finally, for economical reasons, they decided to take the, the trial to UK. So we were quite disappointed because we couldn't actually follow the signs that we had done. Uh, but obviously, we were happy anyway that the, the clinical trial was being performed, but at the end, it's the most important. But then we were approached by this group of people, maybe some of you know it. Uh, they are kind of charity called Medical Cannabis by Two. So it's led by, by Luke Kroll. It's a Dutch guy. I think they had this nice idea of mixing cannabis, that is obviously very famous in Holland, together with bikes that are also very famous. So they organize a bike tour every year, going to different uh, regions. I think it has passed through Slovenia too. And, and well, they were raising money. So they approached us to the lab and we thought that we, they were speaking about a few thousand euros, but actually they have been able to raise almost 300,000 euros. So this, this could be enough to cover a significant part of a clinical study. And then what we have done is to design a new study. Actually, Juan Sepúlveda, this new oncologist, has designed. Obviously, we are just supporting what we can. But the idea is to do a complement, complementary study with the previous one. So it's trying to combine, a, as a first-line approach, patients that are diagnosed with glioblastoma. They will be treated with radiotherapy and, and temozolamide. And on top of that, we will add TAC and CBD. Obviously, uh, this would be interesting because then the patients would be more naive to the treatment and maybe they, they could be responding better. This is more similar actually to the experiment that we have done in the lab. But I think it's, it's important to do uh, more clinical studies, but one has to be aware of the complexity of this. And actually doing this without the support of a clinical company probably would be almost impossible. Actually, we, we managed to get uh, support from, because we needed also the, the cannabis. If you want to do a clinical study, then the cannabis have to be in GMP quality. So they have to be free of pathogens, they have to be packed in a particular manner. So this is very complicated and it also requires a lot of money. So if you don't have a pharmaceutical company behind that supports you, at the end, probably it's very complicated to, to do. So let's see, let's see if, if the, the trial is probably starting by the end of the year, because now it's the protocol is done and they are just finishing the, the last negotiation, but probably this, the results of this study together with the other one would give us a, a very, very good idea of the potential anti-cancer activity of cannabinoids in gliomas. Just to mention, well, it has been just reviewed, but there are very few other studies that are analyzing the effect of cannabinoids on cancer in different patients. Uh, some of them are, are ongoing and I and mean, we need to wait for the, for the results. Obviously, up to now, there are very few studies. Now we need to go for a higher number of studies, and maybe having this positive result in the clinical study performed by GW would be very important, because this could encourage or more studies in this particular type of tumor, or also in other tumor types where we have preclinical data that supports this idea. So how could we do these future studies? That's probably also relevant. So, the combination of TAC and CBD seems, seems to be a good option for therapeutic purposes. It has been discussed that has less psychoactivity and probably keeps most of the uh, activity, at least in terms of anti-cancer activity in this case, so that could be an option. But there could be other options that maybe in the future should be explored using agonists of the cannabinoid receptors or inhibitors of the uh, degradation of endocannabinoids. That would be a way of increasing the concentration of endocannabinoids in the body and maybe enhancing the self-activity of cannabinoids, of endocannabinoids in our body. But that's something that probably has to be discussed. Also, which cancer types? And when we talk about cancer treatment, as I mentioned before, maybe we need to see what is the niche, what are the precise type of patients that could be benefit the most of treatment with cannabinoids. 
So one option could be those tumors like glioma or metastatic melanoma or pancreatic adenocarcinoma. They don't have a good response to current therapies. So probably it's a good idea to try cannabinoids because maybe we improve even uh, for a few months uh, the survival of the patients. We are gaining a lot and also with the type of compounds as cannabinoids that don't have really toxicity associated and also may improve the, the response of the patients to the standard therapy. So that could be an option. Another option would be going to some of the tumor types that in general are responding well to current therapies, but they have subtypes uh, that become resistant. So most breast cancer now is responding well to therapy, but there are a subfraction of patients, that are, for instance, triple negative or with metastasis in the brain, that they don't respond well to current therapy. So maybe in this case, cannabis may do something. Also, prostate cancer in most, most cases is not very aggressive, but when it's aggressive and it's metastatic, then there is no real treatment. So maybe we can go to some of these tumor subtypes, these or others, that may actually benefit of the use of, of cannabis. So but this is a summary of what I have, uh, have been telling. And, well. So the last thing I would like to say is, okay, this is the science, and for science we need to wait, probably, I'll, I'll explain you, uh, a little bit but in the meantime, what do we do? So, what about the utilization of medical cannabis or cannabis extracts in cancer patients? The reality is that nowadays there are two types of cancer patients that are approaching cannabis, medical cannabis. Or patients that have a standard treatments, but they have uh, this um, uh, vomit or lack of appetite or pain, and they don't respond well to the uh, therapy that the doctors are giving to alleviate these symptoms. So they look for cannabis because they feel better. And actually, there is a long experience of many patients that are in this condition. And there are also patients that are not responding well to the anti-cancer therapy. And then they realize that there are some things published. And they think that that could give them some hope. And some of them are trying. Maybe some of them are working. Some of them are not. So what can we do? Obviously, I, I don't have the answer. I just would like to say a few things that, I, in my opinion, we need to take into account. Uh, we have solid preclinical evidences, but preclinical, that actually cannabinoids, and particularly TAC or TAC and CBD, have anti-cancer activity in many animal models. There are also many anecdotal cases of improvement, and we have been told this morning, a few of them, of people who have tried cannabinoids and they have behaved uh, well, or, or they get rid of their tumors, or sometimes they live longer than expected. Or, obviously, we don't know if this is because of cannabis or because of any other condition. And probably uh, for the patient, it doesn't matter because he or she feels better or has lived longer. That's excellent news. But if we want the scientific and medical community to accept this and then to incorporate it as part of the treatment of cancer, then we need to convince them. So this is not enough. This is not enough as for saying that for sure uh, once a cancer is going to be cured by using cannabis. And we have a good preclinical evidence. We have now some results from the initial clinical study that are very encouraging. Obviously, we cannot say for sure. It's necessary to perform additional clinical studies and, and then have a lot of data from there. Anyway, Many patients are going to do it, and that, uh, that will be my, my last reflection. And we need to help them, that's, that's for sure, I'm, I'm for that. But then one important point is the safety of the treatments. The reality is that there is a wide experience on the utilization of cannabinoids for the treatment of patients that are receiving different types of anti-cancer. So many people or is taking medical cannabis or marijuana directly, or even they have, they have get involved in some of these large clinical <laughs> studies that we have said before. So there is a reasonably uh, safety of the treatment with cannabinoids. So one wouldn't expect by, by using medical marijuana, there would be major problems uh, for these patients. So that's really very important. And obviously there could be interactions. I was discussing now during the lunch time, there could be interaction with other drugs because obviously cancer patients are taking many types of medicines, not only the anti-cancer treatment, but also the others uh, to avoid the side effects, there could be interaction, and, and this interaction needs to be investigated because obviously one cannot say for sure that there, there will be not a toxic combination with the new drug. But we can, we can be reasonably sure because there is a long experience of many patients that have received this. 
So taking all that into account, obviously, we, the scientists, are also sensitive to the patients because we are being contacted by many patients with cancer that actually or don't, don't have hope or they are not responding well to the therapy, so they just want to try something else because they see that there is not much hope uh, for them. So not only in the context of cancer, also in, the, in other contexts. That's why I think and I fully support the need for a regulation. As it has been uh, told in the previous talk, I think it's essential to regulate this because many patients need it. They have the right to have access. And it's true that in the meantime, that we have all the information that will confirm or not that cannabis could be useful for the treatment of cancer in general. Uh, it could, maybe we, we would need 20 more years. But what, what can we tell to a patient with glioblastoma that is not responding to the therapy and he knows or she knows that's going to die in the next few months? We cannot say, wait. 20 years, and then maybe we can offer you that. Obviously, as a, I'm not a medical doctor. A medical doctor maybe cannot, cannot also say, take cannabinoids because you are going to get cured. But it's true that we need to find something in between, something that allows the patients to have the right to have access to that in a safe manner. Safe, because it has been told before, the extracts don't have contamination and have the right amount of cannabinoids, and also because it has medical support, someone that can assess the patients which doses could be appropriate, what is the, the best way of administering that. Our exper experience in Spain is trying to push this forward on, also on, on politics and information for the people. We have tried to, to combine medical doctors who are interested on the use of medical cannabis, patients who are suffering that, not only in the context of cancer, but in the context of pain or many other contexts, and also basic researchers who are doing research on, on the therapeutic application of cannabis. And we have generated the Spanish Observatory for medical, or medical cannabis. So we are trying to actually interact with the politicians, interact with the general public, trying to, to tell them that this is something that needs to be uh, solved. And, and just I would like to show the, the slide. Here is Manuel and Cristina that are well known in, in this field, many other people, doctors who are really uh, interested in the use of medical cannabis and they are trying to assess patients and well, other researchers and patients themselves. So I think it's, we are trying to do our best to, to get everybody together. The last thing I would like to say is thank you to all the people who have been involved in this research. Because as it has been said also this morning, the research is not, do, is not done by a single person. I mean, it's a team of a lot of people and collaboration. So these are people who are just in my group, apart from Manuel and, and Cristina that have done a lot of work on this. Also people who are not now, but, but they were essential for the development of the project, but many collaborators in different labs in the world. And also the economic support that is needed to do this experiment. So obviously all this work uh, and many others is, requires all this help. It requires a, a, a team work that is working. Yes, and, and Fatima is also here. Is here. She also did a lot of work on the combination of taste and So. Thank you for your attention, and we can have questions maybe later or now. When, when we... well, thank you. Thank you.